While the colonial era certainly played a significant role in shaping the course of American history, it definitely did not have the best odor. Colonial age American hygiene habits were an odd brew of pragmatics, religion, and social standing. The answer is dependent on how clean is defined. Bathing on a daily or even weekly basis is rare for colonists. Some argue that depriving the skin of its natural oils left a person exposed to disease and that filling a wash tub without indoor plumbing was likely a hard operation. So, what was hygiene like in colonial America? Poor personal hygiene was seen as a sign of rudeness, and some religious individuals even saw it as a manifestation of the sin of laziness. Today, we're going to take a look at what the nastiest hygiene practices during the time of the colonial period were. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to our channel and hit that bell icon so you don't miss out on any of our videos. Okay, so don't breathe too deeply just yet, because we're about to hit you with some colonial stench. Personal hygiene was heavily maintained throughout the 1700s by a complex combination of practicality, religious belief, and social position. Men and women in colonial America bathed their bodies and clothes on a variable basis, often succumbing to disease and disorder as a result. Regardless of the differences between the initial colonies, colonial hygiene in America's oldest cities and rural villages always left a lot to be desired, with aromas, grime, and the waste being unavoidable components of daily life. Middle and upper class individuals attempted to avoid or disguise common annoyances like insects but were typically unsuccessful, while lower class people just fought to survive. A lack of hygiene, on the other hand, was observed, with filth and grime regarded to be symptomatic of all ill manners and sloth. With so many variables to consider, here's a look at hygiene in early colonial times. Bathing was done with a wet cloth and a pail of water. Full body baths were uncommon in the 17th and 18th centuries and were mainly reserved for children, not to clean them, but to harden them. Every morning, men, women, and children cleansed their faces and hands, but there wasn't much more to bathing. Individuals would use a basin, cloth, and sometimes a sponge to clean up wherever they could find solitude. Baths were possibly common, but no soap was used. Swimming was another option, but dips in a nearby stream or lake were more for cooling off than getting clean. Bathtubs, which could only be afforded by the wealthy, were frequently barely large enough for a sponge bath. Protestantism conflated uncleanliness with sin. Doctors were divided on personal hygiene, with some believing that bodily oils and the like were necessary for good health. Others believed that cleanliness was crucial in preventing disease and illness. To exacerbate these sentiments, religious doctrine profoundly affected bathing practices and notions about hygiene in colonial America. Puritans linked a lack of hygiene to the devil and sin, which had social ramifications. Cleanliness was directly related to morality, and those who bathed were less likely to sin, commit evil, or be impoverished. Water cleansed the body from head to toe, with filthiness of person engendering filthiness of mind. Spiritual health was enhanced by clean bodies, clean garments, clean dwellings, and clean settlements. However, Puritans were troubled by the thought that bathing had negative moral consequences. Public baths in particular were supposed to lead to sickness and sexual immorality. Outhouses and privy pots were used for the disposal of all kinds. Colonial cabins had covered outhouses. The chamber pot was used when people couldn't use the outhouse. Chamber pots were often dumped out of a window or near the home. Villagers resided around water sources. Human excrement polluted streams, rivers, and lakes, causing sickness. In 2014, privy pots in Philadelphia showed more than domestic and human waste. Archaeologists recovered glasses, bottles, bowls, and drinking tankards in 12 brick-lined privy holes under an illegal pub. Tanning materials, wig curlers, and local craftsman pottery were also available. Archaeologist Rebecca Yamin said the Revolutionary War era find showed people drinking and talking politics and squabbling more than human excrement. Early colonists had a single tool to clean their ears and teeth. The archaeologists in the 1990s found a silver ear picker at Jamestown's original fort. The early 17th century tool had a sharp pick and a little scooping tool. Ear picks were utilized as toothpicks, fingernail cleaners, and other hygiene activities. The spoon-like side of the ear picker removed earwax but also collected precious material. Earwax prevented the thread from unwinding instead of beeswax. Lye soap was used for clothing and dishes, not for personal care. 
Most colonists produced or bought soap, while wealthy ones imported aromatic European soaps. Colonial America's caustic lye soap, made from animal fat, lye, and ash, was solely used to clean clothes, dishes, and the home. Lye soap was unpleasant, time-consuming, and prepared without measurement. Lye soap complicated colonial American laundry. The caustic concoction, lugging water, heating fires, wringing clothing, and drying stuff made the already exhausting task worse. Thus, only the dirtiest clothes, aprons, diapers, underwear, were washed regularly. Dysentery was common for early colonies. Disease spread in rural and urban colonial America due to poor sanitation. Animal excrement, garbage, and other refuse cluttered streets, while outhouses and privy pots were commonly near water sources and residential quarters. Dysentery, cholera, and typhoid fever were common summertime afflictions. In 1676, Boston's bloody flux killed many children and killed Bacon's rebellion leader, Nathaniel Bacon Jr. Waterborne diseases struck citizens and the military repeatedly. In December 1777, diarrhea, typhoid, and influenza killed nearly two-thirds of George Washington's 2,000-man army at Valley Forge. Military commanders knew the risks of summer campaigning, but disease outbreaks in the South may have helped colonial triumph. The earliest settlers complained about vermin. Captain John Smith, Jamestown Colony Administrator, Adventurer, and Pioneer, wrote extensively about the Americas. Muskets and flies and a certain India bug, named by the Spaniards a cockroach, the which, entering inside chests, they eat and pollute with its ill-scented feces. Ants bothered him. George Washington said his blanket had twice its weight of vermin, such as lice, fleas, etc., Washington spent 1748 exploring the Shenandoah Valley in a bug-infested hut. He learned his lesson and slept outside near the fire on future trips. Living ashes bugs plagued Christian missionary George Henry Loskiel. According to Loskiel, natives called them as excruciating as the scorching of red-hot ashes due to their bites. Shaving was something done for men by men. European settlers in North America didn't shave until the mid-18th century. Barber shaved men. Skilled barbers shaved using straight razors. Barbers were considered lowly due to their racial overtones. In a culture where white labor was too expensive, many slaves shaved their masters while free, non-white barbers worked. Since women were expected to cover themselves, there's a scant indication that they shaved. Blood baths could only be stopped by experienced hands, thus women didn't shave their faces. Women could have plucked or used depilatory creams. The Birth of Mankind and other English and colonial medical handbooks included depilatories made from limestone, arsenic, and other ingredients. Military leaders knew the value of cleanliness but had difficulty maintaining it. During the Revolutionary War, George Washington said unequivocally that sanitation and cleanliness were vital to health and service, directing his commanders to be on the lookout for any disease or contagion that entered military barracks. His main concern at the time was smallpox. He later asked for troops to be immunized against it. But Washington was well aware that military camps were breeding grounds for sickness. Soldiers were instructed to wash their clothing once a week and sanitize their faces and hands every day. Many men disregarded these commands. To keep the camp clean, followers, as they were known, traveled with the military, cooking and cleaning for the men wherever they went. Women supplied critical services to males who, according to one eyewitness, were not used to doing things of this like and would rather let their linen, etc., decay upon their backs than go to the trouble of cleaning themselves. Bathing attitudes in America were not consistent during the colonial period, although some of the country's founding fathers were adamant about women's hygiene. Nothing is so unpleasant to our sex as a dearth of cleanliness and delicacy in yours, Thomas Jefferson once told his daughter, Martha. Doctors urge women to bathe in the late 18th century, mostly to treat disorders affecting female reproductive systems. While Virginia doctor Thomas Ewell acknowledged that women were so constituted as to become disagreeable to the nose, women may employ smell as a defense, to secure security by rendering oneself as unpleasant as possible. Yet the stink was disagreeable to all women. So what do you think? Do you think you would have enjoyed life in colonial times? Would you foul up the place? 
Leave us a comment below and tell us what other parts of life in early America you would like to learn more about.